Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon, and today we have our old friend, the Reverend Dr. Jamie Franklin, back again for another episode. Thanks so much for coming back, Jamie. Yeah, real pleasure to be here, Nick. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be a great conversation. We've just been talking about an eclectic list of topics, so uh, hopefully the, the viewers and listeners will find this really interesting. Yeah, because what we do on this podcast, I have occasional sort of big guests, not that Jamie's not a big guest, but you know, they're sort of guest episodes, but I realize I'm not that bothered about just repeatedly getting guests and clout chasing like some podcasts. I'm more yeah. interested in topics and ideas. So we have this sort of banter episodes with like comedians like Paul Cox and Leo Kirst, and we have Rory for his sort of political banter or debates, whatever those episodes are. So maybe these are like sort of spiritual banter episodes. Don't know. Yeah. They're kind of... I'm not sure what category they're in yet. Yeah, people, I mean, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. He's on my podcast, uh, Irreverent Faith and Current Affairs, um, irreverentpod.com. If anyone wants to look it up, um, I, I, you know, we do have guests on occasionally, but recently I've been, I've been, you know, I've had quite a lot on, and it really has struck me like how much extra work it is to have, like, particularly a sort of higher profile guest where you really feel like you you can't mess it up and you've got to take it seriously. And if they've written a book, you've got to like read it and make notes and give the impression you've read it do you know what I mean all of that yes. kind of stuff so it takes it people don't understand like how much effort actually goes into making podcasts um, they really don't it's, it's, it, it, they, they don't understand they just think oh you know it's just two, two blokes on a zoom call I mean in this case it is a bit more like that but you know in other cases like you know your weekly skeptic podcast or when you have like a big guest when you eventually do the Andrew Tate interview you're gonna to have to take that really seriously you know you're not gonna be able to just jump on the call are you yeah, weekly skeptic is a huge amount of work. I collect topics all week, then I do a few hours beforehand, then it's several hours recording, then it's all the blurb and the title and Toby's tech issues. And it's like, I did, it was like an eight hour day uh, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> then it was like a six hour day last time. It, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. And that's just yeah. the actual day. Then there's all sorts of other things with the company. And it's, oh yeah, it's unbelievable. And then, yeah, yeah and on, on this podcast, yeah, I mean, I remember doing the Doug Stokes episode and being up till 5 a.m. reading as, as much as I could of his book. And, you yeah, know, man. And oh, I'll listen to every video someone's ever done, hours and hours and stuff. That's why I have these in between episodes where we can have a bit more fun. But those episodes are really good, though. I mean, mm. but these are yeah. more fun and relaxed. And I always forget to say the host of Irreverent. I literally tell myself just before I say Irreverent podcast before I start, and I don't. I must subconsciously not want to like promote a rival podcast. Ah, uh, we're not rivals. We're not rivals, are we? <laughs> we're, we're just like it's just like the kind of ecclesiastical equivalent, I think, of, of the Daily Skeptic or or the Weekly Skeptic or whatever. It's quite similar in some ways, isn't it? It's like weekly uh, topical conversation. I mean, we tend to emphasize more stuff to do with the church, but you often um, touch on stuff that we we talk about anyway. I think you talked about the what, which church story did you cover this week? Was it was it the Archbishop of Canterbury wishing Muslims a happy Ramadan? Um, I don't know, but we should absolutely get into that. Um, yeah, it was, and and also the thing about him saying. About this, was it, it was a terrorist attack in Nigeria, wasn't it? That was perpetrated by. Oh yeah, Toby said he couldn't bring himself to acknowledge that it was yeah. Islamist. Was that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So he didn't mention that. He just said, you know, it's a gang or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. What did you make of that? The then the Archbishop, because I this is very much your topic. You're a Church of England guy who's <laughs> holding on to the last remnants of the church, saying let's not leave it. And, uh, and other people are saying, no, let's just leave it. And this is your yeah. sort of debate with Calvin Robinson. I don't know if you've literally debated him, but it kind of won't no, see it like that. Yeah, but but yeah. for context, Welby came out, Archbishop Justin Welby, meant to be a sort of a Christian, isn't he, really? But he came out and said, um, we all benefit from the many ways that Muslims in their diversity, which I thought was such a weird phrase. Like, what does that even mean? I suppose it could mean like Sunni and Shia and stuff, but I, yeah. I, I just think you're just saying diversity. He doesn't, be good mean, he doesn't mean law-abiding Muslims and terrorist Muslims, presumably. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I just think he's just saying it. Like, we made him sound like a kind of exotic lizard or something, yeah. or a kind of fruit or something. You know what I mean? Like, in their diversity, mm. like, he made it sound like he was looking at fauna or like, you know, it just mm. sounded like David Attenborough or something. It's like, it's like, what do you mean in their diversity, yeah. you weirdo? See, or maybe he means he diversity. Mean diverse from us, like yeah, that's not, what, that's, not white. that's what that's what maybe 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 I was thinking. Maybe he meant he like means. not not diverse types of Muslims, just that they are diverse. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Seek to be Go good on. citizens and contribute to our common good. And then later in the speech, in the bit, he said, "I'm so grateful to all of them and to all of those who enrich our society in countless ways." And I just thought that was comical as well because these are two of the main meme words when mocking yeah. leftism, yeah. Are diversity, and enrichment. So yeah, much enrichment. enrichment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When someone's yeah. getting like stabbed or something. And they're uh, yeah. quasi racist memes. But, you know, let's be honest. But but that's um, 
well, it was just what made it funny that Welby was on about that. And the second thing was he went went on about thirty years of women priests. Was it? I need to check oh, that yeah. one. Yeah, what do you think of the years. Ramadan one first? Oh well, I mean, it's 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 nothing new, is it? I mean, he always does this. He does this for Diwali and things like that, and I think for Christmas as well. I, I, and you, you'd hope at Easter. So he he's he's you know he's he's consistent in that sense. Um, but uh, well, it was a little bit like. Um, I was I was on the um, Spectator podcast this week talking about this um, you know this thing where this oversight committee has um, said that uh, the church should apologise for destroying diverse traditional African spiritual practices or something like that, uh, basically implying that um, basically implying that the Anglican Church was wrong to send missionaries to Africa in you know the time of the British Empire to convert them to Christianity, and saying this is basically a tantamount. Uh, apology tantamount to an apology for Christianity itself but the thing that underlies all of this stuff I think is this kind of implicit universalism which which creates or gives the impression of creating an equivalence between Christianity and the other religions and that's what's going on here isn't it it's like well happy Ramadan Ramadan's great Muslims are great we're all great Uh, let's work together for for peace and justice which I think were the exact words that the archbishop said so it gives the uh, two things that like gives the impression of equivalence between the religions. So the religion is basically the same. And then the second thing is it, it gives the impression that um, the purpose of the religions is to work together to ameliorate conditions in society. So we're just here basically to to work together for truth and justice. Um, now, I don't think that's really what Islam is about. And it's definitely not what Christianity is about. And and really what 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 that's doing is it's taking religion and um, subverting it and making it the servant of some other broader ideological agenda. In this case, I think it's a kind of it's a kind of you know it's a, a globalist kind of um, yeah it's it's like a global globalist agenda, isn't it? That's that's behind all of this stuff. I think some something something like that. The, the religions we all need to get together. Uh, because we've got these global problems, global problems need global solutions, and and religion is undoubtedly part of that. So all the all the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians need to get together to to deal with these to deal with these issues. So it's it's something like that, I think. Yeah, very interesting. And by the way, I I posted uh, this guy is going to force me to become pagan, which did quite well because it's just right. so. I mean, he makes you want to not even be Christian, which I know you would obviously resist because um, he's just <laughs> one bloke who's just an, an utter and probably a half wit, but. Um, that made me want to skip into something I was going to talk about later, which is yeah. very much related to what you just said, which is that idea of the Christian church as some sort of, well, I, I was thinking about this in relation to the Sunak speech, that weird speech that he came out and felt yeah. the need to do, which yeah. I said was a sort of defense of liberalism with elements of wokeism when he talks about being a non-white prime yeah. minister presiding over the most diverse cabinet ever. And these, these yeah. were seen as values. But the particular bit I picked up on when he said... Um, In my Substack piece, I put, there was also anti-conservative sentiment in his downplaying of religious traditions and rejection of the Scrutonian primacy of place, as Sunak claimed that it is not the God you believe in or where you were born that will determine your success, citing instead the industrious anywhere man, presumably a managerial manlet in an undersized suit, was how I put it. That's one of my better phrases. (laughs) And um, I hate to go at height, but he's just, you know, he's such, he's so small in all dimensions. He is so small, isn't he? It's ridiculous. He's crazy. He's Um, like a little micro man. It's absurd. And then, um, (laughs) and I said also that the Christian church was praised, but only for its political liberalism, as Britain's multi-faith society was said to be all underpinned by the tolerance of our established Christian church. And I said the image of the Christian church as some kind of bloated bureaucracy there solely to uphold every <laughs> faith but its own is bizarre and disturbing, yet sadly not inaccurate. So yeah. he saw the – it was such a strange thing. He, he downplayed God. He was trying to say, yeah, we're just secular anywhere people who just work away and and we just roam around the globe and we're not really – there's no culture. You don't have a culture. I don't have one, even though I'm non-white, which is also awesome. Uh, but then yeah. when you talk yeah. about the yeah. best thing about the Christian church just being its – its tolerance, all underpinned by, he listed all these different faiths, all underpinned by the tolerance of our established Christian church, yeah. which itself was the only one that didn't get to enforce itself upon the culture. It was yeah. the one that just allowed all the other ones to come in and have their little culture. What a weird conception yeah. of the Christian yeah. church. Yeah, so, I mean, there are loads of things about that speech which I thought were awful. But the thing about the tolerance thing, um, I think, as with many of these things, there is sort of a grain of truth in it. Um, so, let me put it like this: uh, Christianity, uh, in its orthodox form, uh, introduced 
to the world the idea, or at least you know, to to the culture of the time, the idea that uh, you know religion isn't something that should be forced upon people, but it should be accept. It, it's something that can be accepted willingly or rejected. So, in a sense, there's a kind of implicit toler- toleration or tolerance, if you want to use that word, at the heart of Christianity. In that sense, only in that sense, though it doesn't it doesn't mean anything more more broadly than that. It just means that the it just places an emphasis, if you like, on the um, the centrality of the the human conscience. I mean, it's absolutely there, right in the center of the Christian faith. It's about how you know you as as an individual and how you respond to to the message of the gospel. So there is some there is some truth in it, but that doesn't and I, and sorry, just I think genealogically. Um, I'm certain that somebody like Rodney Stark would say that what's actually happened is that 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 principle has been kind of universalized. So now it applies to sort of in this sort of general bland sense to to all of all of society. Um, so now tolerance has become a kind of it's become a kind of value in itself uh, rather than a component of the Christian religion. Does that does that make sense what I'm mm-hmm. saying there? So compulsion um, in religion shouldn't be a part of a, of a properly Christian society. Like if, it, if we had it my way and we had a Christian society, you wouldn't have people being forced to convert to Christianity. You would have to have some kind of tolerance of people, of dissenters essentially, which would include minority religions. That would, that would have to be part of it. So you wouldn't force everyone to be a Christian. And of course, like just to, just to say, there have been times in history, obviously, when people have been forced to go to church and things like that. And uh, you know, I would say that this, this was, you know, this was not right. Um, and I would say actually, this is a, a sort of betrayal, really, of, of that value that I was talking about. You know, the idea that um, we have to sort of choose God freely, um, which which comes to us from Christianity. So, so do you, do you see what I'm saying? There's a kind of mm-hmm. irony. There's an irony at the heart of this because it is sort of Christian, but at the same time, it's a sort of hollowing out of the Christian message. Um, yeah, I don't know if that does that does that make it sense? It makes sense. It's been it's been it's been elevated from a sort of a sort of a, a, a feature of Christianity to its almost almost its soul or main value, whereas yeah. it's, more, it's more like okay, we believe this as Christians, but we're not going to force you too much. The non-forcing part has been put above even the belief part. As a yep. sort of weird value, so we're constantly hearing about we're such a tolerant nation. Really, uh, the British tradition of tolerance. I thought, is that the main tradition? I've even seen it with Gove recently when he's trying to redefine extremism. And when people talk about what the values of Britain are, and they always sort of cite tolerance as if there's yeah. this long tradition of they, civil liberties. I can yes, I can get behind. Yeah. And then they say things like freedom of speech. And they say they cite certain things, but they always cite tolerance. And I always think not history is not. That's like one not necessarily the, the main thing in our history. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, it's not. It's not really tolerance, is it? It's more like freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. You know, liberty is 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 the. You know, that's that's more than what the British value actually is, isn't it? And I would say, you know, you can definitely see how that's come to us out of the Christian inheritance. Um, and that, that was the other thing about the speech. I thought it really valued. I mean, it was clear, you know, in your conversation with Toby on the Weekly Skeptic, where Toby was essentially saying, well, it was quite good insofar as it was a speech that was aiming to bring people together and not to alienate people. But the problem with that is that if all your, if the only aim you have is to not alienate people, you're going to come out with something that's completely banal and empty because any values you espouse will inevitably alienate somebody because not everyone has the same, you know, not everyone is the same and not everyone has the same values. And so what you end up doing is coming out with values like tolerance, which really means nothing, because if you think about it, like, you know, we don't tolerate everything. We only tolerate things which we consider tolerable. So in the, in the, in the right. sense, it's completely meaningless. It's totally it's meaningless. Word. Like, that point, we don't, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't meet, we don't tolerate like child molesters, for example. Um, uh, and well, and many, say that. And we kind yeah, of well, do no, that's now true. with yeah, other yeah. and Telford. Well, let's, and so yeah, but that's true. Well, okay, well, so like, we don't tolerate like uh, you know Nazis or something like that. You know, we so, white child well, uh, molesters. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah. Theoretically, there are there are groups which or people that we wouldn't tolerate. Let's put it that way. Um, and it's the same thing for the hard people work. With stickers, thing. people putting out stickers. Yeah, yeah we don't mean. tolerate people putting out anti <laughs> anti trans uh, transphobic stickers. We don't tolerate those people. Um, but then the other, the flip side works as well as well because he's saying you know the only thing that matters. And I I, I really want to say this something about this that you know um, doesn't matter which god you believe in thing as well. But uh, you know the only thing that matters is hard work. I mean that is just ridiculous. Because uh, everyone works hard, right? So Islamic terrorists work hard to achieve their goals. Do you think the people involved in, 
you know, September the 11th, I mean, you know, provided you think it actually happened in, in that way, do you think they didn't work hard or like the Nazis didn't work hard. It's just complete, it's completely ridiculous. Uh, it's not, it's not a question of whether or not you work hard. It's the, it's the object of the thing that you're working towards, isn't it? Now we all yeah. know that like laziness and, and slothfulness is a, is a character defect, but the, the, the opposite of, I would argue like the opposite of slothfulness is not just working hard. It's about pursuing virtue, you know, or, or however you want to put it. And then the other thing, just the thing, it doesn't matter what God you believe in. I mean, that is just, a, it's, it's such a stupid, ignorant thing to say, because it's quite obvious that what you believe about God is probably, what human beings believe about God is probably the most influential factor in the, the makeup of human civilization that there is. I mean, it's just it's just obvious, isn't it? Like, of course, what you believe out of God determines everything about the way you behave, about the way your society is structured, about your relationships, about your view of, you know, uh, marriage, family, you know, the sacred. It, it determines everything. Mm. And so for the prime minister, it doesn't matter what God you believe in. It's just it's just hard to understand. Does he even thought about that for more than a second? I mean, it's well, just insane. And has he just been has he just been coached into that by his speechwriters? Because really he's saying his God is liberalism, his God is materialism, really. Material mm. materialism and secularism, which is yeah. the God of the sort of average Remainer centrist dad who seems to run this country. But I yeah. might even go further and say privately, he's actually seems to be quite a committed Hindu. So I might even go further and say that's not even his belief. He's doing right. a kind of French thing of taking out his beliefs entirely and saying, Oh, we're this secular culture that's very taught. We're not really, we're not French. We're a Christian culture, actually, and that's really what we are. We've just taken away, yeah. taken that away in the last 10 minutes. I mean, I always talk about this, but, yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. what we are, and we've taken it away. I actually did a follow-up. It kind of could be seen as a follow-up. I was just something I was writing last night, one of my late-night posts. This one didn't get to 10,000 like my last one, which is quite good in a way because then you get a load of grief. But this one I wrote <laughs> last night at 1.26 a.m. I said, we don't have liberalism. I, I was going to say we don't even have liberalism, but that sort of right. gave away my – showed too much my hand straight away, so I thought I'll – pitch this to a wide audience i said we don't meaning that liberalism is not even good anyway but what i went with was we don't have liberalism we have a grievance management society in which everyone is unhappy at all times minorities vie with each other constantly hoping to gain an inch of ground the majority while still extant are hated by the minorities and develop their own grievances this has been the case for a while but has now become foregrounded to such an extent that it feels like the only debate is was latest incident racist Despite the phrase I coined at the beginning, that's not a real society. It's just a mess of mistrustful people barely holding up an economy. These things just come to me, Jamie. I don't always know exactly great. what they mean. It's great. It's I'm really a kind good. of poet figure, but, yeah, but they come to good. me. And the point is, Sunak's speech is very much in that tradition as well. It's, it's oh, let's just manage everyone. They don't want to say Islam. That's what. Look at Michael Grove's definition of his extremism. He's just trying to not say Islam while saying yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Same with, yeah. with the Sunak speech. And so I understand from the Toby perspective why it's a skillful speech. But it, it, it's completely awful if you take it at face value because yeah. it's just, oh, we don't say Islam, but that's kind of what we mean. But we've got these grievances. And now with the, the state of parliament now, my other point there about is it racist, just this Diane Abbott thing, you're racist, no, you're more racist, Starmer and Sunak going back. That's all our politics is now. It's, yeah. it's so depressing. It's just a managing of different cultures that maybe hate each other. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose like the reason Toby liked the speech is because it was technically for, like for what it was. But I mean, you know, I, I don't really think it's really saying anything, but for what it was, it was technically average. I suppose that's like the best you can say about it. If you if you wanted to give a speech which didn't alienate people, if that was your only goal, then Sunax was mediocre. So, you know, that's pretty much the best that could be said for it, isn't it? But I think what you say is it's very true. I mean, there's loads of stuff going along on here, and I'm sure, you know, you've read lots about trying to make sense of what's actually going on sort of philosophically with our politics as well. And I, I've, you know, as I have as well, and it's, it's, it's very hard, isn't it? I, 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 I think that, you know, the observation, which I, I remember reading first in um, Scruton, actually, that there's a sort of um, tension at the heart of the liberal project between liberty and equality. I, th I still think that's, that's behind a lot of this, isn't it? It's that, you know, um, if people are truly free, they're not equal. Uh, if people are forced to be equal, then they're not free. And that's, that's, I mean, don't you think that that's really kind of still at the heart of this whole thing? Yeah, it's like, that's a great point. I've, uh, I yeah. upset young Rory on the podcast by saying that I don't believe in equality. I just say, most people won't even say that because equality, 
takes away freedom, as you've just said, because people aren't equal. So they're trying yeah. to force them to be equal and get them into these equal boxes. Not only is it impossible and a losing project, but it's inherently unfree. And now yeah. equity is the next is the 2.0 upgrade of equality, which just takes it to insane levels. But even yeah. but most people say like an Andrew Doyle or someone, I don't know, put words in Andrew Doyle's mouth because he's very smart. I don't know why they say, but let's say <laughs> a sort of a sort of anti woke liberal, let's say, will yeah. will will have qualms with equity, but not with equality. But I would go all the way and say equality is wrong on the face of it. Yeah, well, I suppose it does. It does depend what you mean, doesn't it? Like I, I believe in equality before the law, but that's because that's a Christian value that, that we we see developing in in the scriptures themselves, and then taking shape in Christian civilization. So treating people fairly um, before the law and the rule of law, I would also include in that. Um, I think that 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 spe- that that comes to us out of the monotheistic tradition of Judaism and Christianity. That's an important point. And this again, this goes back to what Sunak was saying about it doesn't matter what God you believe in, what God you believe in. If you believe in a polytheistic God, you essentially um, you essentially believe in a kind of more morally relativistic universe because you have different gods, you know, reigning over different parts of it and and having their own ethical standards. I mean, that's literally the way it was in the ancient Near East, you know, the world in which the New Testament, oh, sorry, the Old Testament is written. Uh, monotheism changes all of that because it says there's just one standard for absolutely everyone because there's one God, one God, uh, one rational mind, one source of morality, and everyone is therefore subjected to the same moral code. And that's, and that's where you get Western civilization from. It's where we get our... our eventually i would i would argue it's where we eventually get the idea of the rule of law from there's one law and that law applies equally to everyone but as as you as you quite rightly say and it's a bit similar to the thing with tolerance is it's now been like universalized in this kind of general way so it doesn't just apply to the law but it it now seems to apply to it sort of everyone's life in every way like we've all got to be equal i mean it's never clear is it what does that actually mean because clearly we're not equal in terms of you know, how tall we are or how intelligent we are or how good looking we are or anything like that. But we've, we've all got to be equal kind of in, in the, I know, the, 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 the opportunities we have, the, uh, the outcomes that we obtain. Mm. It's, not, it's not really clear, is it? No, it's starting to seem as though e- even that doesn't seem to work in this culture. For some reason, I mean, we had what people thought was meritocracy, and I, I was saying to someone the other night, I'm not even sure that really was meritocracy. I was saying it last night. Someone replied to me and said, why can't we just go back to uh, treating what happened to treating everyone the same? That seemed to be working very yeah. well. And I said, my guess, this, can I just, these things come to me. I don't know anything or read yeah. books like you, Jamie. I just said, my I guess did. is meritocracy was itself a product of the dominance of English liberalism in the West and obviously in England combined with social cohesion. This was undermined by a combination of leftist thought and competing cultures with different traditions entering the scene. So I meant that I'm not sure we had this idea there was a universal meritocracy, uh, but I don't think it was. I think that was just actually our tradition. And you see the other cultures aren't that into it. And actually they just they don't they don't care about meritocracy. And you also see that leftism specifically is an anti meritocracy. It's about equity. So yeah. what my point is, your thing about treating everyone the same on the law, we don't even have that in the current system because you're allowed to say anything about white people and you're allowed to sort of exclude them from jobs and constantly attack them. So why does our current system rely on a constant attack of, 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 this, yeah. of the majority? It's a kind of strange, because we don't really have meritocracy anymore. We have now, have maybe for a period we did, and, we, and it would have fit with your, your conception yeah. of equality there. Well, well, maybe it's like the the sort of identity politics thing, and now is undermine. Well, it is, isn't it? It's undermining the rule of law, so that people aren't treated bef- the same before the law anymore. And we, and right. uh, ironically, we're actually losing the only the only sort of aspect of the the idea of equality that's really valuable, which is that people are treated equally before the law, and people can't just arbitrarily break it. I would right. I would just be. I think there is a slightly. Um, a, a slightly more based position on the meritocracy aspect, uh, if I may. Um, I think that the the idea of meritocracy, having a kind of total meritocracy, is a kind of early modern thing, probably probably coming to us out of the French Revolution. I imagine, um, you know, because it because it implies, and I'm not saying you're necessarily applying this, uh, but it implies the sort of breakdown of the the class system. Um, you know, the having an aristocracy um, and having a you know a, a working class or you know just what you might call ordinary folk. Um, you know, there, I, I read um, 
Patrick Deneen's book last year, which is called Regime Change, where he actually argues for a kind of, uh, I forget what he calls it. I think he might call it like a mixed constitution. But he was actually making the point that, um, that you know, privilege of birth is actually very valuable for a society for all sorts of reasons, not least because those in the aristocracy can preserve elements of culture that can't easily pres- be preserved by, you know, your ordinary your ordinary uh, man on the street but then but then conversely the working class or like the ordinary folk have a have a knowledge of um of uh practical skills they have common sense and other values of that type that kind of you know ordinary kind of working working class everyday knowledge and wisdom practical wisdom which the aristocracy don't have access to and through this kind of mixed constitution uh society society benefits as a kind of uh, mutual um a mutual benefit that these the, the two classes give to one another and you could argue that too much of an emphasis on a meritocracy actually undermines that because it because it it could be seen to be critical of um you know privilege uh privilege of birth let's say and people being you know so like you know, for example in our day like the house of lords is a major source of controversy isn't it because mm. people say well people shouldn't be born to the privilege of, of that sort whereas my, my my what i've said you could you could quite easily see how a case for something like the house of lords uh, might be might be made yeah i'm i'm pro house of lords yeah no this is that's correct i was replying to a guy on x saying what about treating everyone the same and i was yeah, replying yeah. to his his take on meritocracy and i wasn't even necessarily <laughs> advocating because as, you, as you're right, the more base position is to go beyond it you sound like everler who i actually confess i haven't read but apparently he was one of the few people to critique the Nazis from the right. He said the Nazis were too left wing <laughs> because he believed in aristocracy and he didn't believe in in the sort of some of the equality that was in yeah. their uh, in their in their formulation. So I need to read yeah. him because that's hilarious. But um, yeah. but yeah, that's really interesting. The, the 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 sort of many people many people say okay, we had we had this liberalism in the nineties and so on that, that we probably miss, but. But the curious mind goes beyond and starts to say, "Hang on, what was all that?" Like the, the, the most, the average liberal says, "Oh, hang on, equity is a disaster. Let's get back to equality." The curious mind, as I'm calling it, just to big myself up, goes beyond that. And goes, "Hang on, <laughs> is equality even the thing?" Either and yeah. is prepared to go that extra yeah. step, and that's when you get into yeah. base things. And you're talking about. I mean, it reminds me. Of, you know, I did this brilliant episode with Academic Agent, brilliant because of him, not me, about elite <laughs> theory. And elite theory would, would yeah is not about meritocracy either. It's just the elites run everything, yeah. and the will of the people's a myth. So whether that's a good or bad thing, but that just seems to be how it is. Yeah, you're, you're actually advocating it. You're actually saying that actually meritocracy is not even necessarily good. You believe in a sort of more like the nobleman, the the lord. The yeah. Sort of yeah, yeah, inherent, yeah, yeah. Kind of reminds me of what Tolkien said in one interview when he said something like doffing your cap to the squire is not necessarily good for the squire, but it's good for you. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you just think about it, right? What what kind of country would you prefer to live in? Uh, a, a country where the great the great country houses are owned by the national trust, or where, or a country in which they're actually owned by the aristocracy, and they're used as real great houses with estates, and you know, with people working on the land, and you know, the the whole the whole picture of the whole picture of the aristocracy, I would argue, is an ennobling force. And the 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 only reason that it was destroyed in this country is because of resentment. It was class resentment in the you know in the nineteen twenties uh, that led uh, that led to um, you know the the exorbitant um, uh, inheritance tax, which basically destroyed all the great estates. And now and now look at them. Now they're in the care of the National Trust, who are just uh, a, a neo Marxist. Um, woke organization who hate everything those houses stand for so it's it's awful in that respect neo-marxist national trust that's a, <laughs> quite a funny thing to have a pop at like the, the neo-marxist let's take down the national trust no i know they, they are they are they're, now. they're horrendous they're oh, they absolutely are, they are horrendous but it is just quite funny to be it like, is well, it's an irony neo-marxist irony. postmodernist <laughs> national bloody trust <laughs> But you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, yeah. But wouldn't you? I mean, that's why I like. Look, I know people make fun of me because I really like Downton Abbey. But that's why I like Downton Abbey. It's because you see, like, have you ever watched Downton Abbey? No, and they should make fun of you. But okay, but only no, because it's, it's for no, women. Yeah, but the, you see what it's doing though is it's subtly undermining the the based the based um, attitude towards this. Like in the first in the first episode of uh, Downton Abbey, the first time you see Hugh Bonneville's character, who's Lord Grantham, he's walk he walks down this. 
Um, well, it's not really a spiral staircase. It's kind of like a, a rectangular staircase with a couple of turns in it but he walks down that and they've got the the music and he's got his dog you know and he's dressed like a lord and he's in this beautiful house um which is called high clear castle which is actually not far from where i live but in the show it's called downton abbey and he's walking down because his you know his breakfast has been served and he's going to go into this beautiful uh this beautiful room with this huge picture of charles the first behind him i think it is you know and his his uh his unmarried daughters around the table and they all receive their posters, you know, it's 1912 and everything like that. And you, and you look at that and you think, this is like the height of civilization that we're looking at here. Like this is, this is, this is the high point of human civilization. This is as, as sophisticated and as cultured and urbane as it, as, it, as it has got in Western civilization. And that's the whole point. It's supposed to ennoble you. It's supposed to sort of raise you raise your spirits and think, you know, great, you know, we live in this kind of country where this sort of thing is going on. And it's, mm. it's, a, it's just a nice, it's, it's a, like, I think that's the best word I can think of it without being trite and calling it nice or something like that. It's ennobling. It ennobles the human spirit. I'm not just down to Abbey, just like the whole idea of, of the aristocracy. And as I say, the only reason you would, in my view, want to get rid of it is just because people are resentful and they think, oh, you know, well, mm. you know, we shouldn't have people with who are really, really rich because I'm not rich. I just, I consider that to just be, just completely narcissistic. Interesting. Yeah. So you'd probably be one of these people in favor of sort of building incredible cathedrals and monuments where just thousands of people die in the making of it. But as long as you get yeah. that beauty at the end. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think probably the amount of people who died, you know, building medieval cathedrals is exaggerated. But yeah, it's definitely. But the pyramids worth it. is the one one always thinks of, although no yeah, one knows they, how they, they were made. Those, Aliens. Those are, built, those are built on the backs of slaves, though. So it's completely different. Oh, I see. Like, the medieval workers were very happy and probably really well paid. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose yeah, yeah, there's almost sort of Ruskin argument for the Gothic architecture where I come from, where they have John Ruskin School in Coniston there where I'm from, but he was very much about the Gothic architecture. And the, there is a sort yeah. of argument about the, 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 the fulfillment of working on those beautiful buildings for the labourer. They're doing something, they're using their skills to create something beautiful. Yeah, there's definitely an argument for all that. We've lost yeah, all yeah. that. Um, two things came into my head as well, really random thoughts when you were talking about that. One is, because I've just done this, I've started my top 10 novel series on my sub stack, yeah. nickdixon.net. Yeah. And my first one is Thomas Bernhard, who no one's heard of with his brilliant book called The Loser. But he also had a book called Gargoyles, which is where he discovered his um, literary style. You see in the middle, but he starts with a more realist style. Then he has this section called The Prince, where it's just a prince going into a rant. And this was where Bernard's style emerges, which is a long monologue with like no paragraph breaks a kind of stream of consciousness, and it's genius. But the prince, is, from recollection, is kind of ranting about that kind of Marxism and kind of like the end of the kind of aristocracy and that way of thinking. So I think Bernard yeah. was the kind of person who believed in that as well. And um, yeah. the other thing that came to my head there was Churchill and Hitler. Churchill was, of course, the, you could argue, in a way, he was the last of the aristocrats. He was an aristocrat and, mm. you know, yeah. completely yeah. above the fray of ordinary people, happy to yeah. send an innumerable soldiers to their death. Uh, and yet, and, and of course, the Second World War is in many, many ways the end of the empire when we, we were clapped out and we needed America to help us and they took over. But yeah. then Hitler, you know, Hitler gets a bad, <laughs> it's a bad rap, you know, people are very, but if you were going to go full equality and lefty about it, wouldn't you say Hitler's actually, this guy, dirt poor after the First yeah. World War, pulls himself up by his own bootstraps. Isn't he the, the lefty hero versus the aristocrat Churchill? Yeah. Yeah, talk about someone with the work ethic. I mean, you know. <laughs> he had the work he, ethic. He had the belief. He had the equality. He came from a tough, tough background. You know what I mean? It, yeah, his, his Churchill's um, the aristocrat. So you know. Yeah, yeah. Churchill was born in Blenheim Palace. I mean, uh, he's uh, yeah, complete total aristocrat. You're, you're quite right about that. I mean, um, I think wasn't Hitler's dad? He was like a he was like a bank clerk or something, wasn't he? he used to beat the hell out of, he used to beat the shit out of him basically every day. And um, yeah, he was, yeah, as you say, like it was dirt, dirt poor kind of, um, uh, a f yeah, complete sort of failed artist, wasn't he really? And just a total nobody. And it was only through his, um, it was only through his speaking ability, which he sort of um, discovered by chance that he was able to do what he did. I think, I, you know, I have to say, I think there was some, you know, there was some kind of demonic element in what Hitler was able to do. It was like he was able to sort of hypnotize people almost. It's, it's extraordinary when you actually read about the accounts of, of, of his rise to prominence. It's it's almost unbelievable. Yeah, this extraordinary charisma that apparently Jordan Peterson has as well. It just depends how you use it. But um, mm. but actually, maybe Hitler, maybe he's the ultimate case for individualism and, and liberalism, actually. I'm, I'm just changing my mind because if he was able to just, through his own, maybe, maybe he's the meritocracy, through his own abilities, was yeah. able to... Yeah. I don't know. 
Well, might, well, I think what we could say is that he he um, demonstrates why, at the very least, the weakness of liberalism, doesn't he? Because he is democratically elected. Um, it's uh, kind of. I mean, there was a bit. There was a bit shenanigans. There to was get to there were some point. shenanigans, but essentially, you know, it was it was a you know he was able to he was able at least let's say to use the democratic system that was in place at the time to to get where he was, and then he I forget the details, but he but essentially sort of. Um, he essentially made it so that he had absolute power quite quickly, quite quite early on. Um, but that that's the same kind of thing that you know we've. I'm sure we may have even talked about this on this podcast before. Uh, uh, Michelle Welbeck talks about in, in submission, right? I mean, anyone can do that. You know, Hitler could do it. Muslims can do it uh, as they do in in submission. You know, it, that that book for people who don't know is about you know um, France in the not too distant future, and I think it's a French prime. Is it French president? I think who is is elected a Muslim French French prime minister, and then they in, then they just implement Sharia law immediately, and that's that's the point. It's like liberalism can be really tolerant um, of everyone else, but then it's it's potentially open to, and you might say sort of inevitably open to somebody being elected who is not tolerant, and then who imposes an intolerant ideology. So it's a bit of a problem in that respect. Yeah, I'm rereading that book as we speak. By the way, for the, I'm reading it for the second time. Yeah. I'm going to write about it soon. Uh, it's well a fantastic back submission. book. It really I is. Think it's, I think it's like the best sort of novel I've read that's been written in the last like 30 years. I would say I think it's an excellent book. Well, he's the greatest living novelist, and I think you can make a case that um, he. I'm just checking if, if Coetzee is still alive. He is. He's 84. Okay, Coetzee yeah. is still alive. I think, but Welbeck is a case that he's almost the last. He is the last great novelist that yeah. there may ever be because yeah. he's sort of revived the form to talk about these themes but there's no one else really coach the last one as well he, he was he's a great writer he's 84 yeah there's no one else really that i can think of. yeah yeah there's also a really good uh, sort of spiritual component to that book as well because it's about his sort of existential and religious journey and of course i mean i don't want to ruin the ending for people but he, en- he eventually becomes a muslim so that he can re-enter his academic life and be polygamous and he sort of talked into it like this sort of white Western nihilist, Parisian nihilist who just thinks, well, actually being a Muslim uh, as a man would be a benefit to me. So, you know, let's, you know, let's yeah. have at it, as, as Peterson he would just say. just goes along with it, more or less. I mean, yeah, I yeah. mean, you could argue that's what Tate's done, but I wouldn't like to say that in case it, in case it is totally <laughs> sincere. Um, Casey Peterson. Well, it's also, it's also based, by the way, with Tate, I believe, and I haven't spoken to him about this, uh, uh, but it's also based on probably this kind of the kind of muscularity of it and the masculinity of it um you know this is something i was going to ask you whether whether one should become a pagan i mean obviously i'm asking a vicar i know what you're going to say but there was an <laughs> argument made by um jonathan bowden who was one of the he's like one, one of the greatest speakers ever to live even though he is uh, considered very very controversial because of his political affiliations but he um right. he made an interesting case that paganism and christianity are the wrong way around because he was saying that when that when one thinks of a pagan, you think of witches and wicker and kind of nonsense and lefty hippie stuff. I'm not sure you do anymore because I think now people are talking about it again as base and stuff. But at that time, whereas Christianity is sort of as associated with the conservatism, particularly in America, whereas he was saying really Christianity is lefty because it's all about equality and things that you've just you've mentioned. Whereas yeah. paganism is a celebrates inequality. Yeah, um, I was running the other a few weeks ago before I got this cold and I was. I was just suddenly imagining when I was listening to some sort of fascist metal music and I was just imagining myself as a Viking. I was thinking, there's a guy in front of me, totally unaware. I was thinking, if I was a Viking, I'd just come up, slice him down with an axe. Wouldn't this be like, wouldn't this be living like, because I've got people can maybe tell from my light hair, which even though it's getting gray now, I have like Viking heritage. Yeah, I need yeah. to check the details on it, but I've got, there's some evidence. Yeah, yeah. Most of us yeah, probably yeah. do in this country now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for I was sure, thinking, for sure. should we be Vikings, embrace paganism and Odin and the sun and things like this? And is, is Christianity just too wet now? Well, no, I mean, no, obviously we shouldn't do that. Uh, what we should do is all become Christians and then and then we can we can row back from this this craziness that's happening. The, but the best way to think about the progressive uh, woke liberalism is that it's a her- it's a Christian heresy. Right. So and, and, and it proceeds from. Uh, well, it proceeds from all sorts of things, but like essentially, it proceeds from the sort of formal rejection of the Christian religion. So we we need to go back to Christianity uh, and to embrace Orthodox Christianity, and then to implement Christian values from that point. So one, you know, I've already given an example of one of what one of those would be, which would be the rule of law, um, and to to have that uh, consistently applied 
within society and and you know all sorts of other things as well like uh, for example it shouldn't be legal for children to be uh, to be killed in their in their mother's wombs and we shouldn't be tolerating that as a as a nation because it's it's uh, murder and it's an offense to god uh, and you could you could come out with all sorts of other things we shouldn't have like public pornography well pornography should be illegal and people who make it should be put in prison uh, we should have the death penalty for for murder and for rape and for other crimes and all sorts of things which would proceed uh, naturally from an orthodox uh, christian perspective like i just can't understand christians who don't who don't see things this way that we should be christians and believe it's true but not think it should be implemented in some way politically uh, I just read actually a really good tweet um, today, which was actually quoting the of all people that this uh, very famous Baptist preacher called Charles Spurgeon, who said uh, there are some Christians who think uh, Christianity should be kept out of politics. Uh, on the contrary, that's precisely the place it should be. So I would say that. And the other thing I just say about paganism, and of course, like the word pagan is so is so broad that you know it can mean loads and loads of things. But um, uh, Charles Taylor, in his great work, A Secular Age which I've written um, a book about, uh, which you know, I never never mentioned this book, obviously, but I've, I've, re- I've written a book about Yeah, my, that's my, yeah, so it's an adaptation of my PhD. But in his book, um, the, A Secular Age, which is a truly great book, he talks about uh, the, the shift from a sort of pagan viewpoint to, to um, what, what he calls the, the axial age. So like the axial revolution, um, the, the big the big sort of shift really in, in human consciousness, and I don't entirely go along with him because he's basically a kind of Hegelian. So he sees this as a kind of linear sort of progress in mankind, but whereas, you know, I don't quite see it that way. But essentially, essentially it goes from paganism. Now, paganism is like a, it's like a form of imminentism. It's about worshipping things which are in the imminent realm. So like you just mentioned, like the sun or, you know, whatever it might be, the sea or, or creatures or whatever. So it's about it doesn't it doesn't have a kind of transcendent realm beyond this one as, as part of its kind of um, imaginary, to put it like that. Now, uh, you know, Judaism and Christianity and you might you you probably argue Islam and Hinduism and, and religions like that. But, you know, I, I'm really talking about Christianity here. Um because it's because it's relevant and because it's true as well. Um, Christianity has um, does have a transcendent realm. It worships a God who is beyond the imminent order. And uh, the reason that that's important, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons that that's important, but politically it's important because um, there because whoever you are, you know, whether you're a king, whether you're you know Hitler, whether you're a you know Rishi Sunak or whomever, uh, you're not higher than the Most High God because you're part of the imminent order. Um, so there is always there is always recourse to justice uh, and to and to a righteousness and a goodness and a truth and a beauty, I would argue, that transcends this realm. So that's why you need that's why you need Christianity, because you need that. Otherwise you'll end up with other otherwise you'll end up with the kind of deification of the state or or the you know the the uh, the charismatic leader or or whatever it might be. So mm. Christianity is like the ultimate safeguard against any kind of political totalitarianism for that reason, basically. Yeah, you stop, you, you avoid the child emperor who's a god who's who's sort of born and is seen as a god, at least in some of the more rural outskirts of the country, with yeah. certain Asian countries and so on. That yeah. would, would have been the case. And they still try and do it with, to some degree in North Korea and things, don't they? Yeah, yeah they um, do. Interesting. That's a good case made for yeah the, the hierarchy implied in in Christianity yeah. and similar religions. Yeah. I mean, and, and can I just say as well about the woke thing is like Christianity is absolutely hierarchical. I mean, it just is. It's, it's hierarchical in every sense, like ontologically hierarchical, you know, like insofar as like the, you know, there's a, there's a passage in the new Testament, which says that um, the wife should submit to the husband as Christ submits to God. So, you know, this is not when Christianity is not like woke progressivism. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's an implicit, hierarchical structure within the, the the Christian metaphysics. Now, I would argue it's not diminishing of women in the same way as like Christ is not diminished by submitting to the father. So the wife is not diminished by submitting to the husband. So you've got to, you've got to factor those things in. But nevertheless, like Christianity is, is a, it implies a benign hierarchy. So it's, it's very different to this kind of flattening, kind of like everyone's just the same. Everyone's on the same level. That's not the way it is at all. Yeah, a listener to a previous episode complained that one of our guests advocated for the, the woman to submit to the man in a relationship. But um, 
Hey, this may not be the podcast for you if you don't think that because we, <laughs> it's a hierarchical podcast. Yeah, guys. I mean, there, there needs. I mean, there I'm needs to be Jamie. some pass. You know, need to be. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> there needs to be some. There needs to be some passing out of that, right? So, I mean, I've said this in many places, but like in in Ephesians five, like Paul says, like you know, Christ. Uh, sorry, husbands love your wives and give yourself up for them, as Christ gave himself up for the church. Wives submit to your husbands, right? It might be the other way around, actually. But anyway, the point is, it's like, yeah, the wife submits the husband. As in, like the wife recognizes the husband's kind of headship over the family, but the husband's role is to give himself up, like Christ gave himself up on the cross um, for his wife and for his household. So, yeah, okay, so he might be in charge, but you know, anyone who's ever been in charge of anything knows that when you're in charge of things, there's a lot of pressure on you. And especially if you're called to like lead in that sort of sacrificial, self giving way, you're the one who's called to die, not your wife, right? So, if there's that kind of sacrifice to make as a husband, that's you're making it. You know, you're not beating a wife and like, you know, telling her to get back in the kitchen and all this kind of stuff. Um, you're 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 leading from a place of sacrificial love. So anyway, yeah, I mean, she should be already in the kitchen, so you shouldn't have to say get back into it. <laughs> she shouldn't actually leave it. Um, just to that's clarify what what Jamie meant there. Um, no, well, actually, in the hierarchy of this podcast, you know what you're talking about, and I'm just asking you the questions. So you're above me in the in this stuff. Um, the um, the what about muscular Christianity as well? Because that was a okay. thing, wasn't it, in the nineteenth century in Victoria? And that was about self discipline and strength and patriotism. I know it yeah. mainly now as an Instagram meme account, but it was it was kind of <laughs> that was a thing where the attempt to see Christianity as more masculine and, and tough. Yeah, well, we've lost we've lost that sense of of Christianity. That, this is something I, to be honest with you, like I'm I'm in a really great position at the moment because I'm preaching every week, and that's like um, it's, I've been in I've been in in post now here for about. Uh, in Winchester for about seven, uh, how long? Like eight or nine months. I'm preaching every week, and one of the things that is really I'm thinking about is um, how to emphasise those aspects of Christianity which are there, but which because of, because of the way we've been so conditioned, we tend to we tend to underemphasise. Like the challenge of Christianity. Um, I'm just trying to think. What was I preaching on last week? Oh yeah, yeah I was preaching on uh, John chapter three. So yeah, that's the bit where you know, as everyone knows, uh, Christ says, "God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then He also talks. There's a, this section immediately afterwards. It's not even a different section. It's in the same place where He talks about um, the light has come into the world, and people stayed in the darkness because they, or people preferred the darkness because their works were evil. And I was sort of saying in that section about that section, um, you know, this is this is a really pertinent psychological observation, right? Is that the light comes in this world and everyone would think, well, the light, that's good. Okay, so we'll all come to the light. That sounds nice. It sounds you know, fluffy and warm. But actually, there's something about the light which is deeply worrying, you know, because if you come into the light, your works are exposed. So God sees you, you know, God sees who you really are. He sees your sin, the things that you're ashamed of, like these have to be exposed. And that's a difficult thing. Right. And that's that's, you know, I'm going to start sounding like um, Jordan Peterson here, but that's not easy to do that, you know, to 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 really and truly and honestly admit who you are and what you've done and your shortcomings. That's really hard. And so what I said in my sermon was, you know, people say, you know, Christianity is like a crutch for the weak. And I would argue completely opposite. The weak position is to stay in the darkness and to just continue committing all kinds of sin. Now, everyone can do that. Anyone can do that. The really strong position is to overcome yourself and to bring your deeds, to bring your failures and your weaknesses into the light so they could be healed. And so Christianity is the ultimate challenge because it's the challenge to overcome yourself. And I think that's that's a really important sort of that kind of thing is a really important thing to emphasize that this is not about weakness. This is about strength. You know, it's about it's about rising to something. It's about becoming something which you are called to be by God. Um, it's not about like being nice or do you know what I mean? All that stuff. I just hate. I can't stand it. It's not about being nice. It's not about, you know, having people like you. And if that is right. probably if you do it properly, people probably hate you. So that's what it's about. So I'm trying to emphasize that. Well, I've nailed that part then. Um, not, being, <laughs> <laughs> not being nice and uh, being a yeah. dick. Um, the, when you're. Yeah. <laughs> when you're this is, i'd love to be in your congregation It'd be like a free philosophy seminar every week when you're really cooking does, do people ever shout preach and you're like i already am that's, that's literally what no. i'm doing <laughs> ignore that question um, people don't do that when you do it's not like kind of church um, yeah it's not like kind of church we're when, English, um, English. I, I, I would love to go there when when you talk about challenge this this leads me to something i was going to ask you about lent because we're in lent yeah you probably know i've given up coke zero 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, someone convinced me I could drink normal Coke as a loophole. So I've occasionally ruined it by <laughs> drinking a normal Coke as a loophole. On a Sunday as well, you told me there was a loophole. So I've yeah, just been yeah. exploiting these loopholes of drinking normal Coke and I said, yeah. like it's ruined it. But I've done better it's, than isn't, anyone else isn't has normal, to. Isn't normal Coke just the same as Coke Zero, but with like sugar in it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but... Uh, so you're saying it's even worse. Yeah, I mean... I'm just saying it's the same thing, but just with additional <laughs> sugar. <laughs> but I've only drank it occasionally. And what I used to do was just drink Coke Zero all day, every day. But I admit it's been very hard. I mean, the first couple yeah. of weeks I managed it. I, I, I yeah. can say I've not eaten, eaten. I've not had a single Coke Zero. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But I've, I've occasionally that's done good. these terrible loopholes that the devil has convinced me <laughs> are okay. But I've done a lot better than Rory. He tried to give up social media, didn't manage one day. I've done a lot better right. than Toby trying to give up alcohol, which he never managed at all. So I'm yeah, speaking to these people who are even worse than me, Jamie. But what have you given up something? Or is, 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 as a vicar, is your life a kind of ongoing length? No, no, I've, um, I've, uh, yeah, I've done, I've done a bit of uh, abstinence. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm not drinking, uh, not eating anything sweet. So that's what I've been trying to do. Nothing done sweet. A bit of, yeah, I've done a bit of fasting as well. Um, nothing major, but because um, yeah, Emma that told me she'd given up um, chocolate, she said it would have been easier to sort of simply have given up food, which yeah. was hilarious. But Nothing yeah. sweet sounds very hard, and then. Well, I mean, there are a couple of things. But I'm you not know, drinking you... either, by the way. I'm not even counting that because yeah. I'm just not yeah. drinking, so I'm not even counting yeah, well, that. Yeah, that's just obvious. Yeah. But that's nothing just sweet. The that's the Jordan Peterson way. Well, I've just. I mean, to be honest with you, it's hard when you actually start trying to do it. You recognise that there are some things you just that are in. You know, like I've got a fizzy vitamin C tablet, for example, which is sweet, <laughs> which I kind of still accept. You know, I still. I'm still drinking that. So, you know, it's just about not uh, indulging, basically. Uh, having something that's slightly different in your routine, deny yourself something that you're going to notice in some way. And there are all sorts of things you could say about it, but I suppose like the, the point is to not just to give something up, but to um, reorientate your heart towards God through through prayer and recognizing your emotional dependencies upon upon things like you know alcohol or or um or sweets i mean it's a very normal thing for people to give up meat during lent and uh, that's something i would like to do by the way but um i just it's it's pretty impractical for me at the moment because four nah, children that's lame someone just came out uh, doctor, even a harvard doctor just came out and said you need meat for your brain so that was quite based veganism yeah yeah on the no way I, out. I agree i agree from a health perspective i wouldn't advocate ve- vegetarianism or veganism or anything like that but but people do often give up meat uh, right. in the orthodox church they give up um loads of stuff they all give up uh, as a matter of course meat eggs i think basically all dairy oil uh and things of that sort now they do i actually spoke to an orthodox priest friend of mine who said that they still have they they there are still ways of you know finding protein and other sources of nutrition which can help you you know fats and things like that uh, which can help you during that but the the um orthodox lent which actually starts this saturday they all do it as a matter of course so it's way more hardcore than uh than in western christianity wow uh, yeah so so it's it's just about that i mean it, in a way like um it, it's really relevant for us and again it does come back to what i've just been saying because i think that our culture is kind of predicated on the notion that human life is just about comfort basically i mean what's the meaning of life i was thinking about how would i actually sort of summarize what our culture thinks and I'm sure you must have seen that. Have you seen this as Spinal Tap? You must have. Of course. You must have watched that. Yeah, yeah, of course you have. Yeah, it's an insult even asking you. I recognize yeah. that. But, you know, one of the, I think it's the drama, is it, who says like the meaning of life is to have a good time all, all the, time. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like that's that's basically what our country, culture Hedonism. is about. It's about, yeah, it's about cult. It's about comfort. It's about, um, yeah, pleasure. It's about indulgence. Like that's what we live for. So if we work, then the reason we work is because we're working in order that one at some point like later in the day or you know when we go on holiday or when we retire we can indulge in whatever it is you know whatever whatever takes our fancy um now the christian answer to that question of you know what we exist for is not to be comfortable it's not to indulge in pleasures in this life is to i would argue it's to is to grow in virtue and righteousness through godly action in in this in this life um so uh you just froze when, for a second which was annoying because you were giving the meaning of life okay and on our internet connection i missed it because you froze but i got the gist of it it's not all about yeah. pleasure because i've started well, yeah, thinking I, my only pleasure is is eating ice cream and everything yeah, else is yeah. just a grind and that's why i've got fatter since i gave up diet coke uh, coke yeah. zero sorry it's been harder and i've ended up eating more that's why viewers will notice i'm fatter 
but sorry, I cut you off there. But you were so the yeah. meaning of life is not it's not hedonistic pleasure. It's not just working in order to get a reward. No, it's got it's godly action and growing in virtue or growing in holiness or growing in, in righteousness. That's that's what we are called to do. That's what we're created to do in this world, right? And we will live forever in in perpetual glory and bliss with God in the hereafter. But what we're called now to do is to is to grow in holiness and is to respond to the callings that God has placed on our on our lives, which doesn't generally speaking include, you know, floating around in the Mediterranean drinking uh, milk from a golden bottle, as you know, I've heard Jordan Peterson say something like that, like a like a giant baby. Um, so that's not what we're that's not what we're here to do. And it's a pathetic vision of what human beings are called to do in this life, right? And this, incidentally, is why people are called uh, are attracted to people like Peterson or they're rediscovering philosophies like stoicism which i personally think is is a, a good step by the way i mean i read stoic philosophy and i find it really helpful is because it reorientates you away from that sort of pathetic vision of life as just one sort of endless um set of experiences of indulgence after another and, and work as a kind of you know an interruption or any kind of responsibilities like you know having children as, as an interruption in you know my pleasure my my indulgence and so on and so forth so anyway this is kind of like a long-winded way of saying that this is what this is what lent is about if you want to think it, think about it in this way it's about saying no to that because you're essentially saying no to the ideology ideology and the worldview that it represents, which is like, I'm just here to have a good time. I'm just here to, to pleasure myself. I'm just here to indulge myself and actually to, to raise your, raise yourself to something higher, to transcend that kind of animalistic um, bestial way of thinking about human existence. So that's what you're doing when you're, when you're denying yourself these things you're, you're, you're saying to yourself, I don't exist for this thing. This can be a component of my life, but it's not the purpose of my life. And also I've got it under control as well, which is another aspect of Lent, which I think is really important. And just the concept of abstinence in, in, in general, it's about training yourself in godly discipline and self-control. So mm. those kind of things really. Interesting. And even uh, someone on this, I hadn't heard about the golden bloody milk bottle, but uh, the interesting one was, um, that's not even my best Peterson, by the way. When I hit it the best, people freak like out. Like a giant baby. Like, that's what he says, giant, like a giant. Giant bloody baby. <laughs> Why don't you just a baby. giant baby yeah, drinking a... milk from a bloody golden bottle? Like a jump on his golden it. toilet. <laughs> what? Yeah, giant. that was what he said. He said, got a giant baby with a golden bottle yeah, floating around. I can't remember exactly. Floating I think around like drinking that. bloody milk. <laughs> <laughs> Golden milk, yeah. Um, I started thinking about Tate because obviously I, I've not talked about him for a while because obviously Tate's controversial for his, well, they would say reversion to Islam. We, would, we might say conversion, his uh, take on Palestine and, of course, his correct views on women. But but one thing he has said is that life is sort of about discipline and hard work. He's talked about a constant yeah. state of war for men in particular. Yeah. Because he talks about men, and well, he doesn't really talk about women in that sense. But it's a constant state of what, and he is sort of correct on this. It's like training your mind to think like that. And he, he, even this has a kind of Lent-related aspect. He talks about he only eats once a day at any time, and he talks right. about like, oh, you're hungry, oh, oh, bread, oh, bread only, gay. <laughs> like, so he just says it's gay to be like, oh, I'm hungry. Like, there is something in yeah. that, like, you know, like. Just he, this discipline of doing, you know, and obviously he's, as a trained fighter, he, he's developed a lot of discipline. Yeah. So is that just is that so? That's another, another aspect of it. But we have this illusion that of the the Mediterranean holiday, whatever it is. I mean, I've not been away since 2017, so I'm the wrong guy. I don't yeah. go on holiday. There's no joy in my life of any kind, but <laughs> except ice cream sometimes. But is it, is it is it just the illusion? Because we you get there, the, the archetypal millionaire retires at 30 to get to live on the beach or live the laptop lifestyle whatever well it was kind of like the illusion of retiring at 30 and things like that wasn't there and then people yeah. just find after a week they're bored and it's awful yeah yeah so of course. It's, it's, yeah. i suppose that's the peterson golden baby people, thing, but it, people die when people die when they retire don't they i mean like you know there's a massive spike in deaths like statistically speaking after they retire it's because people don't have any reason to live they think they think that like that's what they're living for is just to be sort of put out to pasture like you're a yeah, cattle or something. Like no, I don't your life in retirement. Is... No, no. Well, I don't really either, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, no way. I mean, that's yeah, that's that's what that's what happens. They get out there. I mean, people who are smart, you know, like my grandfather, they keep you know they keep going. They keep living mm. a productive life. They keep up their social relationships. They keep doing godly things. You know, um, serving at their church or whatever it is they might be doing, and they they still live really fully productive lives. But it's like the word retirement is just so negative isn't it it's like retirement 
what yeah. does that mean? It's like it's like you're being you're being marched down to the the yard and shot or something. That you know, said, I mean, Ben Shapiro's in, in trouble at the moment for saying that we should raise a retirement age and having a go. And then people are saying, well, you, you never have to really work. You're a posh kid or whatever. So there is that. I mean, if you have to do back-breaking labor, yeah, you should be able to retire because your body's broken. So I do want to flag that as a yeah, caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a slightly different question, though, isn't it? That's the question of like the sort of proper sort of recompense for people who have, who have worked and pay taxes and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it gets in, us into a whole kind of other right. conversation about the welfare state and all that kind of stuff, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But, um, I know you've got a ghost thing, but what do, you, what do you think about the aspect, other aspects of Lent in, in the temptation of Jesus passage in Matthew? When what, What's this all about? It, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Fairly straightforward. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I think yeah. I can get my head around that bit, but this is where I'm, I'm not fully understood. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. So he tries to take him to the pinnacle of the temple. I've heard this is to do with power or political influence. And then Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not, be, you shall not put the Lord God to, to the test. Yeah, so is it about is it about jumping off that bit and that it'll be fine, but you shouldn't test God, or is it about some sort of political power? Because then there's the second, there's the next section which is which is about power and, and having everything. Where it says again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, "All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me." And then Jesus said to him, "Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve." Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So. I think I was reading Bishop Barron or watching a video and he was sort of saying one of them is about political power, one of them is about other, other powers. I, I didn't really understand that distinction. I thought the second one was more about just sort of tempting God and the third one's about power. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I've not seen the Bishop Barron thing, so I imagine it's very clever and um, is ever, and very clear, like everything he does. But um, the second one, so the first one is about... Um, is about uh, uh, it's a, a quote, they're all quotations from the book of Je- Deuteronomy. The first one's about uh, finding you know your fulfillment, your spiritual nourishment in the presence of God, as opposed to you know material material um, pleasure. I would say, or you know material satisfaction, or whatever you say. But you asked about the second one. I the way I understand the second one, and by the way, just a reference for this, I'd really recommend. Um, there's a passage on this in Joseph Ratzinger's book on Jesus. I think it's the first volume uh, on the Temptations, which is very very good. It's just called Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. But um, and that's Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Mm, yeah, he was, he was controversial he was a, pope, but he was actually kind of based. It turned out. Uh, it, was, it was very based. Yeah, yeah, very based. I mean, yeah. So a couple of questions uh, here and there. But anyway, it's a completely different issue. <laughs> anyway, the second temptation. Yeah. So what's going on? The devil says, you know, he takes him to the temple. So the temple is very public. Lots of people, you know, hanging around there. And then he says, throw yourself off the pinnacle. And then you know, and then he quotes from the Psalm, which is Psalm ninety-one. And you know, the angels will bear you up. So he's essentially saying. What, what what I think is that he's saying that, you know, Christ throws himself off the temple and essentially, you know, he'll be saved by angels and people will see this happen and that they will then, you know, hail him as the Messiah or, you know, whatever it might be. So, and the reason Christ reject that, rejects that is because it is not the way that God has planned for Christ's ministry to take place. It's not the way that God has planned for his identity as the Messiah to be revealed. Ultimately, his ultimately the way Christ will reveal himself to the world is through his suffering and death on the cross. And uh, it's just fresh in my mind because I'm preparing a sermon about it this week, which is in John chapter 12, where Christ says, you know, um, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will call all men to myself. That's how ultimately God reveals Christ in the mystery of his suffering and death, not through gaudy miracles, you know, jumping off the top of the temple. And, And also in that sense, shortcutting the work of of his saf- sacrifice, suffering, and, and death, you know, through his passion. So that's so. I think that's what's going on there. The devil is essentially offering him a shortcut, and he's rejecting it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the third one is he's just offering him what sort of all sort of worldly power or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think so. So you could read that as, as just a, an offer of like straightforward political power. And again, you see that temptation occurring through Jesus ministry when pe- it says, you know, in a number of places that people sort of um, they they plan to make him king, you know, make him king by force, uh, you know, and, and of course, Christ 
could have could have brought this about had he wanted to you know at one stage he says you know i could command a legion of angels to come and 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 fight for me but i this is not the way i'm doing things type thing so so i think that's what it's about it's like well you can just have this you can have all of this but again this isn't the way that that god's kingdom comes into the world it's not the way that god has chosen to do things you know actually it reminds me that that joseph ratzinger book in this section um it's this fantastic quote which i actually said at my uh, installation here at, at the church where I'm at, um, and I see if I can remember it. Uh, it was it's like this. Basically, that Joseph Ratzinger makes this point that Christ did emphatically not bring about peace on earth. You know, the the end of the end of hunger, the end of war, the end of homeless, homelessness. He didn't bring about a perfect society. It's just it's just absolutely the case. He didn't do that. So it raises a question, which is what did Christ come to the earth to bring? What did he come to to show to humanity? And Joseph Ratzinger says, the answer is simple. He came to bring God. That's the answer. He came to show us God. And now we can know who God is. Now we can know God's love for us. Now we can know the face of God in this world and what he calls us to in this life. That's what Christ has brought. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because he didn't bring an immediate solution to all of these kind of social problems. And I think that that's probably what's being offered in the third temptation. It's like, well, you can become the king of the world and you can ameliorate all of society's problems instantly. But ultimately, that's that's not the way. The way is actually something which is much more um, complex and in some ways troubling than that. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it's probably a great ending for the podcast because you've got to go. But we, there's so many topics we didn't get onto, though. Like you want to well, talk I, about I, euthanasia. I could, I could do like... I could do like 10 minutes more probably. Do you want to do another um, 10 minutes? What would you or like you to leave it there? Well, it, 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 there's, I don't know, because it was quite a good ending, but also do you, you, what would you rather talk about? Because there's so many things you probably don't want to talk about the OnlyFans girl. That was trivial. You probably want to, do you want to talk about <laughs> Starmer legalizing euthanasia? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we could talk about that. I think that's an important issue. By the way, the OnlyFans thing, it's not, Nick and I have not been on OnlyFans, just to be clear. So, <laughs> yeah, that was a woman, that was a girl who was going viral for converting from having an OnlyFans account to suddenly being Christian. And people were skeptical, including me, about the whole thing and whether you yeah. know how that works. But, you know, I'm sort of cynical about that. But what would you say on that? Yeah, I, I, don't, I really don't know, to be honest with you, about the OnlyFans girl. Um I think uh, it was interesting. She said that she felt like Christianity was a cage and it was, you know, she was in this kind of, you know, she was homeschooled and her dad was a pastor in a Baptist church. And it just made me think, I wonder why she felt, I wonder why she felt like it was such a cage to her, you know, this life that she was living in. Maybe it was too strict. Maybe it wasn't. She kept maybe saying religion wasn't. is a cage, but Christianity is not, which was kind of a meaningless statement. She clearly meant organized religion. Well, I yeah. I mean, I kind of think, that kind of distinction is slightly spurious, to be honest with you, because Christianity, well, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, but like the word religion is basically a kind of early modern word that was made up by the, you know, by the people who wanted to promote the nation state in order to subvert all sort of metaphysical beliefs to the, to the, to the power Are of the Are you saying the only fans girl hasn't approached this with sufficient intellectual rigour? Is, is <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, so that would be interesting. But can I say something about this euthanasia Yeah, thing? yeah, because um, it's so important. Is Star yeah, wants so, to legalise it after the election he's hinted. But he hints yeah. a lot of things. So but... this, this, is, this has been the first time when I've seriously reconsidered uh, my decision not to vote for the Tories in the current general election. Um, and I know lots of people feel the same as me because they just can't stand the Tories and think they're awful. Um, the only argument I can see for actually voting Tory uh, is to, in order to guard against something worse happening, which is Labour coming in and turning this country into into what Canada is like. And um, this this thing about euthanasia was a moment where I thought to myself, I mean, I haven't really decided. It's not you know, it's not it's not necessary at this point. But but you know. Starmer, you know, if, if what he's saying is he wants to bring in legalized euthanasia into this country, and he probably, you know, he just wants to take us down this path. Now, this this issue with euthanasia, I think it's um, it's another staging post on the way to turning our civilization into a hell on earth. Basically, I mean, if you look at if you look at what's going on in in Canada. So I've got some stuff here. So they're made medical assistance in, in dying scheme that started in 2017. Uh, the amount of people who've been killed by the state in Canada has increased by about a third every year. Over 30,000 Canadians have been euthanized 
uh, since, uh, or according to the figures of 2021, 10,000 people were euthanized in Canada alone. In, sorry, in that year alone, 2021, that's 3% of all the deaths in Canada have been carried out by the state. So the state's killed 3% of all the people who died in, in, in Canada. Uh, it's not just people who are in extreme agony who are facing imminent death, uh, those with serious disabilities, those with health problems, and those who face dire uh, circumstances also qualify. Uh, there's also um, a euthanasia of children. This was first uh, this was first legalized in uh, Netherlands in the Netherlands in 2005. So this uh, this um, this was the first country that uh, legalized uh, the euthanizing of children since the Nazis. Uh, and then Belgium started uh, euthanizing children uh, nine years later. Uh, it's legal in Holland to euthanize children from between the ages of one and 12 if they have, quote, such a serious illness or disorder that death is inevitable and the death of these children is expected in the foreseeable future. In Canada, the main scheme has extended euthanasia to, quote, mature minors, stipulating that the death of these children should be, quote, reasonably foreseeable. Um, so this is, I mean, there are two things here. Firstly, there's kind of the, you know, there's the obvious slippery slope thing where there's just, once you've opened the, once you've opened the floodgates and you've started seeing people in this way as potential objects of euthanasia, that's where this is going. All right. So we're, so we're, we're changing the medical establishment. We've already done it with, with pregnancy so that, 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 you know, a hospital can either be a place where a baby is cared for or where a baby is terminated in the womb. We're going to extend that kind of logic to all of humanity with euthanasia. It will make it will make all human beings the potential uh, subjects of objects, I should say, of euthanasia. And it will probably be generalised in these countries unless something happens. It will probably be just generalised to almost everyone. You know, as people die, as they get ill, as they start suffering, it will just become normal to euthanise them. We can already see that in Canada. Three percent of all the deaths were carried out by the Canadian state. So there's that, obviously. Like you can't, once that those floodgates have opened, that's it, it's over. Um, then the, unless you pull it back, obviously, and just make it completely illegal again, which it should be. Uh, uh, but there's the, but the, it, it, there's a deeper question here, which is the metaphysical question, um, w- which relates to the inherent sacredness and dignity of human beings. The reason that human beings should not be euthanized is because we are, uniquely made in the image of God and we carry within ourselves the the something of the sacredness and dignity which God has bestowed upon us as a result of these things um, that's why human beings shouldn't be euthanized we have an end which is beyond this life again it relates to this issue of like what human beings are here for we're not just here so that we might live pain-free lives we're not just here to to live in comfort and pleasure we're here in order that we might know the eternal God and live in his presence now and, and forevermore. So, so this is, this is a, is a much deeper kind of philosophical, metaphysical and religious question here, but the consequences of this, if we go ahead with it as a culture will be catastrophic and it will be terrible, absolutely terrible for our nation. And it will be just, it will be a further step on this road to post-Christian decline and the death of our civilization. So, I know that's not a very cheery message. Uh, one, one point, actually, just to just to put here as well, this is something I read in Danny Kruger's book, Covenant, which is actually pretty good, I think. Can I just read this quotation? Danny Kruger, is apparent irony that through the long centuries during which death was often drawn out and painful and the old, the disabled and the weak were genuinely a burden on families and communities, state-sanctioned euthanasia was never thought of. Yet now... That medicine is rapidly diminishing suffering at the end of life and we provide support and indeed legal protection against discrimination and ill treatment to infirm and disabled people. Our culture is clamoring for the right for doctors to administer lethal drugs to people whom they judge to be better off dead. So that's an interesting point, isn't it? It's like we can actually relieve people of most of their pain through painkillers nowadays. We've, we've got more sophisticated technology in that sense than ever before. And yet, this is the moment where we say, "Oh, yeah, we we need to put people out of their misery." So, mm. why is that? Yeah. Well, presumably, it's because it's the lowest value we've ever placed on people in this strictly materialist culture. People are just matter; they're an inconvenience often. And yeah, you've got the expensive. you've got the net zero madness. You've got the oh, what people are bad for the planet. You've got the the nihilism. I would say even genocidal impulse behind the climate movement. Because I say yeah. genocidal because it's never just nihilism, and ne- they never commit suicide. They always say 
we need to get rid of people like which people well some other people that i don't like yeah. that are clogging up not the environment. me not, exactly. not me not my kids exactly but your it, kids your future kids exactly. you shouldn't have any kids yeah exactly yeah. it's a genocidal movement and and so yeah once you devalue people to that extent you've said there's no god you've said they're just material you said that pleasure is the only goal so if you're in pain then presumably there's no meaning because you've taken away the pleasure in a, yeah. in a hedonistic secular society right so yeah that's all people are sort of pleasure units that if it's taken away that there's nothing else there and yeah the yeah. abuses of it i mean that argument you'll struggle with if people aren't christians but the slippery slope abuse argument is uh, yeah. is, all, is almost open and shut because i mean look at this uh there's a 41 year old woman in canada was euthanized in 2021 after telling doctors she wanted to end the suffering caused by her fibromyalgia in private however she told friends that she actually wanted to die because she was so poor this is from yeah. michael deacon's article in the telegraph Disturbing though it may sound, many Christians actually think that's justification enough. According to a poll from last year, over a quarter of them believe that poverty is a legitimate reason to be granted an assisted suicide. Meanwhile, Christians some cam- Canadian camp- huh? Did you say Christians? It says Christians that. here, yeah. Meanwhile, some Canadian campaigners want to expand the right to assisted suicide even further, so that anorexic and the mentally ill can quote benefit from it too. So it's just unbelievable. It's terrifying. I mean, in Canada, you see those like, disturbing, like there's that disturbing advert where people say, like, it's the only advert where white people were allowed, where it's like, I'm going to kill myself. And it's great. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. That was basically the thing. It was like upbeat music. We're all going to kill ourselves. It was so disturbing. And then I just picture them, yeah, giving you a leaflet, much like abortion. You feel these days, it'd be like, would you like to abort your child? It's going to be easier. There's going to be a pressure to just abort yourself. There's going to be like, here, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like? Wouldn't you kill yourself? I mean, there's a guy here. They're quoting in Canada. The only thing he listed was hearing loss. Sixty-one year old man. He was euthanized, yeah. even though the only health problem he'd listed on his application form was hearing loss. I mean, let's just also focus on the or touch on the hypocrisy of people that constantly say, "Oh, I wouldn't want the death penalty. Wouldn't want the state to kill anyone." Aren't they the same people who are probably going to put through euthanasia? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Starmer wouldn't it's- be pro death penalty. But it'll be pro yeah. euthanasia. What are you doing? Yeah. At least death, well, death penalty is there for a reason. You've killed someone or, or do something yeah. horrific. It's all it's all it's all to do with what you. It's all to do with the sacredness of human life. So the the death penalty. We've spoken about this on the podcast, haven't we? Like it finds its its first sort of biblical foundation in the story of Noah. And I think is it Noah chapter? Uh, sorry, Genesis chapter nine. I think it is where it basically says, you know, if, man was made in the image of God. So if another man sheds a, ma- a man's blood. His yeah. blood shall be shed because yeah. he has because he has defaced the image of God in yeah. another person, and that's why we should have the de- death penalty because it's an affront to the image of God in man. It's an affront to the sacredness and the dignity of man. And the reason that we got rid of it is because we lost that sense of the dignity of man. And you can actually see this in the criminal justice system now. Look, I'm not an expert, but I hear about these things from time to time. When you have people who are rapists and murderers, like these this this guy who killed these two poor students and this. I think it was a 65-year-old caretaker in Nottingham, which was just down the road from me uh, when it happened. I remember the day it happened. You know, he's he's gone. He's 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 in like a mental health facility, and he's sort of eligible for parole in five years or something like that. You know, know. it's absolutely it's absolutely crazy. And yeah, and then uh, uh, as you say, to the choir here, no point in. Yeah, yeah. I tried to get Rory and people like this to see the death penalty is just on the ground you just laid out the paradox of because human life is so sacred you can't take it and also because the british people support it for child murders terrorist murders and serial murders that's shown in polls yeah. and it was got rid of in the 60s by leftists but anyway i could go on about that forever yeah. what was your it's, second point the point yeah well the point is it's a safe it's a safeguard against the degradation of human life in 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 society more generally so what you get is you get the you get the abolishment of the death penalty and then you get the legalization of abortion and now we're going to have the legalization and promotion of, of euthanasia. Yeah. That's that's all that's all congruent. It's all about the denial of the sacredness yeah. and the importance of, of human beings. And, and David so Borson talked the about same that thing. we mentioned before. Yeah. He said, uh, and once they got rid of the death penalty, I said, abortion will be next. And I was right. And he was yeah, completely well, he right. Was. It came just after yeah. the abortion was legal. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's an inversion of, it's, it's another inversion, isn't it? You, you get rid of the death penalty because you say, oh, oh, we can't get kill someone in that way but then you say we can euthanize them so it's a kind yeah. of inversion you, you don't kill them when you should and you kill them when you shouldn't yeah exactly it's completely opposite way around to the way it should be can i just make a plug lick because uh, i know i know my i know my editor will want me to do this i'm actually writing a book at the moment where i'm making this point it's going to be published by hodder next year it's it's called um the great return why only a return to christianity can save western western civilization and this kind of thing is exactly the point that i'm trying to make the only way that we can stop this from happening is by reverting properly 
to a Christian view specifically of humanity, because otherwise there's no safeguard against this. This is just going to continue and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So, um, so yeah, when the book comes out, I mean, maybe I could come back on the show. I'm sure, I'm sure I've come oh, back yeah. multiple times by then, but, um, but that's, that's my, that's my, that's my view that Christianity is the only hope, you know, I, I, I like, I love Toby Young, uh, clearly, but like when he talks about like a secular political philosophy, mm-hmm. just being generated out of thin air to save us, this, it ain't going to happen, mate. You know, Christianity is the oldest intellectual tradition in the West. It's the most powerful civilizing force in the history of humanity. It's all we have. It's all we have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that wasn't Toby's greatest moment. Yeah, as, as Louise Perry was saying on your podcast, you can't really just come up with some ad hoc thing. There are basically a few set choices of systems we've found that work. And you almost have to yeah. choose from them. And obviously you're saying Christianity is the best. But there aren't that it's, many more. There's well, secular it's, it's, it's materialism, that, which it's, isn't going very well. There's yeah. Islam. There's paganism. There's Islam. Yeah, yeah. Paganism is not very nice, by the way. I mean, I know you know you've watched The Last Kingdom. You know what it's like. Uh, I mean, unless sure you're, have, unless actually. you, if you don't watch Last Kingdom, if you watch Vikings, I think I've watched some of Vikings. Yeah, I oh, know it's a tough I mean, world. It's savage. It's absolutely savage. Yeah. I mean, I suppose if you were a Viking, then you might have a good time for a little bit. But even so, I, I, I don't think they were satisfied deep down. <laughs> you don't think the Vikings had a rich inner life? No, it was, it was a, <laughs> an emphasis on pillage, and after that was done, it was probably quite a short pillagey life. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, Short violence. Thrills. Yeah. yeah. Vital. You, you probably felt quite alive and vital when you were chopping down the village and just, just surging yeah. in and doing whatever you want. But then probably yeah. you probably died quite after of an axe wound quite yeah. shortly. Yeah, after. exactly. And just to go back to the other point where I swear about the Christianity thing, I know that you're saying that um, it would, you wouldn't necessarily convince an unbeliever by talking about the sacredness of humanity. But what you could say, I think, is you could say, well, look at the consequences of what happens when you get rid of that idea. Don't you think it would just be better to almost accept that just on a kind of provisional basis for the time being, even if you even if you struggle to believe in the literal truth of it? Don't you think it would just be better provisionally to believe in it? And it was actually, I think, was James James Orr was on this podcast, wasn't he? When he talked, to, he gave that fantastic image, which I've subsequently stolen, and I'm kind of doing it again now, although I'm referencing him, of a cathedral which has pillars in the midst of it, and it also has uh, uh, buttresses and i think he was saying like the buttresses could be like the sort of people who are sympathetic to christianity but who are you know not yet christians themselves and then the pillars within the cathedral would be the the actual christians who actually believed and mm. i think you know i think in this in this sort of in this uh christian fight back against the post-christian nihilism and culture of death i think you know we can take in we can take in both of those kinds of people, both those who, who really believe in Christianity, but also those who are very sympathetic to it and see its see its value. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. I just know what the, the people in my football team are like. I always use them. They're kind of extended blobs, secular, Remainer, liberals. I just know what they're like, and I know that you won't get it. One of them's a Christian, but I don't mean him. But you won't get anywhere with them with the kind of sacredness of life and you know those arguments, and they'll just see you just a mad Christian. You will get somewhere yeah. with the fear of, hang on, the guy went in for, you know, a hearing issue or the woman actually was just poor and so was killed. You'll scare them then because they'll think, what if that was me or someone I know? And, you know, that's yeah, the only way yeah. I can think of getting euthanasia not put through is by appealing to their fear for yeah. their, you know. Their, yeah, I uh, think I think that's true, isn't it? At some stage, people will become scared by the power that the state has and they'll start thinking about alternatives. I guess like what, what we need to say about what we need to say to people is like we need to we need to. You know, ultimately, it'd be better if we start that process earlier rather than later so that we don't get to a position where yeah. we're worried, you know, the state is going to take our, you know, our, our seven-year-old with MS and euthanize them because and they look don't at fit the, some kind of... Look at the abuses of COVID. Like, it's one step beyond. We're going to yeah. just keep you all in your houses. Actually, we're just going to kill you all. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just going to be easy. We need to get the population down. You stay in your house and watch Netflix and we might euthanize you as well. <laughs> it's not like yeah, it's yeah, a exactly. short leap, isn't it? Yeah, Disturbing. well, that's, I mean, you've got you've got people like you, Yuval Noah Harari, basically oh, yeah. almost say, saying, th- implying them anyway. You know, he says, well, we should oh. keep people, we've got a lot of useless people and we just need to keep them occupied with Netflix and video games. But uh, it's not, it's not, it's not far away so from awful. saying. I mean, it's no, it's no coincidence that he looks like a demon, is it? Is that fair to say? Yeah, the physiognomy no, is real. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree. I agree. Fat at the moment, at least I don't look like a demon. I agree. I just, I can't stand the way he drones on as well with this kind of nasal voice, and you know, maybe people don't like the way my voice sounds, so maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't go on about that. But there's something about him which is, yeah, I agree. I think it's deeply, 
evil really it's evil what yeah. he's promoting how is how is what he's promoting particularly different from what nazis were were promoting i just i don't really see you know he's basically he hasn't got the cool uniforms gen- either he hasn't even yeah, got, yeah, he hasn't exactly. got anything. he doesn't have the stylish clothes does he um, or the, or the yeah. speaking ability and, and, you listen to what he and, says a lot of times it's just banal rubbish when you break it down yeah yeah and he's a vegan as well did you know that Ugh, of course he is that's yeah. just, that's the final straw for me Maybe that's why he wants youth. I mean, maybe we could bring. I don't want to say we should bring euthanasia for vegans, but it's just it's worth just thinking about. But um, well, it's it's, it's the vegan thing is again, it's part of this thing of equalizing humanity with the with the animals, isn't it? It's like saying, well, you know, oh, we don't yeah. have any dominion over the animals. We don't have any natural authority over over creatures, and it's it's a denial of the scriptural the precedent of of uh, you know uh, after the flood. Again, it's funny how the, many of these things go back to these kind of primordial supposed primordial passages in genesis isn't it after the flood god gives the animals to mankind for food but you know of course you know vegans would would deny this and say oh you know we're all equal you know yeah and they're usually they, pro-abortion they should... as well they, they like animals yeah. more than people really yeah 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 exactly exactly i'm glad we so ended up bashing vegans what a great episode so many things covered <laughs> so great to get all your insights i'm just a layman as always asking dumb questions but we have actual insights from a proper vicar who's read loads of books has a PhD and a thesis he doesn't talk about, and a forthcoming book. Are you going to say, how are you spelling return in that book? Is it with the V or the, I've seen that kind of going around a lot of the moment. <laughs> That's a good idea. I'll ask, I'll ask, I'll ask the publisher about that and see what they I don't the, t- totally understand allow. the origins of that. Is, that. is that a Catholic thing? I think it's like a kind of, no, I think it's like a Latinate sort of font, isn't it? To have Vs right. for, I have to have, sorry, use, sorry, Vs for use, right? Yeah. So no, I was going to go for just the, just so people could read it really. Just, When's that coming out? So it should be coming out um, Easter 2025. So I've got a deadline oh, yeah. in a few so few months. Out. So I'm just working working on it now. I'm handing it in May. So so yeah yeah. Then yeah. then it will come out in a year. So I'm hoping I'm hoping people will read it. So and I feel a little bit reticent about talking about it. Like in all seriousness, it's it's a vulnerable thing. You know, as you know, as a creative person, uh, when you're when you're trying to make something. Uh, but I know I have to start promoting it, so I've got to start mentioning it, you know, so that people know about it. Oh, yeah, you'd be worried, like, oh, what if I don't finish it or something? But, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you will. Um, okay, so definitely get Jamie's book when it comes out. But for now, go to Irreverend Podcast, available on all podcast platforms. You've got your Substack yeah. as well, which is... Yeah, my Substack is jamiefranklin.substack.net. Our podcast website is irreverendpod.com. So if you want to find it, irreverend with the D at the end, pod.com, everything is on there. And then my Substack, which is just a personal blog where I write about sort of spiritual issues, uh, you know, reflections on stoicism, uh, events that happened to me. Like I dropped a weight plate on my foot last week. Oh, so I wrote about that. In, yeah, so wrote, wrote about that. In, like mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Jamie so. Franklin 40 is your ex account. Yeah. Uh, anything else you'd like to plug? Uh, no, not really. I think that's pretty much everything, everything in terms of, oh, well, if people live in Winchester and they want to come to church or nearby, come to Holy Trinity Winchester on Upper Brook Street. It's a great church, Anglo-Catholic traditionalism, Orthodox doctrine, take the faith really seriously, really, really intense sermons that I preach all the time. So, you know, come along. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine that would be very, very based as a church. All right. And um, if you want to support me in this podcast, of course, it's buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon. Leave a donation there in the form of a digital coffee and leave a comment, which I'll reply to. Buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon. And my Substack is now at nickdixon.net. I've got a custom domain, nickdixon.net. I'm writing loads more articles. I've got my top 10 novels. I've got culture war articles. I've got all sorts of stuff on there. And it's high-level writing, let's be really honest. Nick yeah, yeah, it's good writing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm, sub- I'm subscribed to it, Nick. I read it. Oh, thanks, it's good. mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, no all right. Well, there you go. A recommendation from an actual vicar. And um, <laughs> nickdixon.net. Find me a coffee.com slash nickdixon. I think that is pretty much it. And obviously, you probably you know the weekly skeptic already. And so, yeah, that is it. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm sure we'll see you again soon. And thanks for, to everyone for listening. And we'll see you again next week.